Hey, my name is Tyson Barker, and I am the head of the Technology and Foreign Affairs Program at the German Council on Foreign Relations. And it is my honor to be here today as the moderator here at the BSF talking about strategic partnership as the next catalyst of digital transformation. Um, and for anybody who was at the uh, talk with Tony Blair this morning, he said the most important thing is tech and specifically tech governance and getting together the IT folks together with the policymakers because we are coding the governance that we're living with right now. As, as has been quoted many times, Lawrence Lessig used to say, code is law and we know this in this situation. So we're going to have a great discussion today. And like all discussions at this conference, I think it's going to be inflected by Russia's war on Ukraine. Uh, when we talk about catalyst for digital transformation, uh, I think there's nothing more that can be a catalyst than war, than existential, existential threats. And we see that right now with Ukraine. And if you look at what's happening right now in Kyiv, in Kharkiv, in all the cities of Ukraine, I think a lot of what has happened in the past six months we wouldn't have expected. And I'm pretty bullish on the future of Ukraine. I think that the future is going to look a lot like Israel. And we see this kind of uh, developments already taking place right now. The uh, development of partnerships with the United States and the EU to harden cybersecurity and create cyber resilience. The creation of the IT army, these 100,000 people who are supporting Ukrainian uh, cyber resilience across the board. Uh, the use of Twitter diplomacy, which we see, which is forcing companies to leave Russia. And Russia, in many ways, is having the catalyst in the other direction, with massive immigration of IT specialists, and of course, the United States and Europe working together to cut off uh, intellectual property on key chip uh, design and manufacturing technology, which is really going to lead to the steady erosion of the Russian economy. So uh, technology is really a vector of foreign policy, and it isn't discussed enough. And of course, both in the acceleration portion and the deceleration portion, the decline portion, which we're seeing in Russia, the key element, of course, is partnerships. So we're going to have a conversation about partnerships today, specifically the Euro-Atlantic partnership uh, and how that's affecting tech governance on this continent. And we have four excellent speakers to join us. The first is Andrei Lozakuk Petri, who is the chairman and scientific director of the Joint European Disruptive Initiative, or JEDI, probably the coolest name of any organization on this panel. Uh, the second is Aida, uh, I'm going to try to do this, the last person did this amazingly, uh, Kamishalic Latific. Good? Aida uh, Kamishalic Latific, who is in the minister's office of the Ministry of Digital Transformation for the uh, Republic of Slovenia. Then we have uh, Yeva uh, Valeskaika, who is the Vice uh, Minister of Economy and Innovation at the Republic of Lithuania. And finally, we have Ig Igor uh, Zglavich, Some Zglavic, who is Government Affairs and Public Policy Director for Central and Eastern Europe at Google. So let me start with the big question, and this question is for Aida. So I'm going the right way this time. So one of the conversations that we have a lot when we talk about tech policy and tech and geopolitics in Europe is the question of what is the quest for European digital sovereignty? Um, and we heard a speech yesterday uh, that Chancellor Schultz gave in Prague where technology was surprisingly one of the key issues that was discussed. But what you don't always hear is the central European perspective on what digital sovereignty is. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how Central Europe sees the question and the quest for digital sovereignty. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I would start. Ah, oh, my. Oh, okay. It's <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, uh, I, I would say that modern European industry uh, is vast, uh, vastly uh, diversified. So um, um, we can, as a Europe, we have to. Think we cannot limit uh, uh, ourselves, and we have to focus uh, our further strategic uh, orientation um, on uh, industry, diversified industry, and we cannot just um, um, enter into only few perspective industrial uh, sectors. Uh, so. Um, um, 
we must further develop um, economy, diversified economy. And of course, uh, it's important uh, for a holistic uh, orientation toward the green uh, and digital, digital transition across the uh, whole economy. Uh, so uh, um, this will then be a good fun foundation for a, a sustainable uh, future of the European uh, society. Um, so high-tech products should not be a victim of uh, global uh, dependencies uh, on the state of the art of technologies and chips, uh, semiconductors, raw material, uh, uh, supply chain. So uh, this is uh, um, really important. And before at the other panel, this issue was already uh, mentioned. Uh, so um, in cooperation with our transatlantic uh, our partners, we have to develop this diversify um, high-tech industries. Uh, which will be resigned to such obstacles um, and highly, of course, uh, reach a highly competitive uh, um, and be also highly competitive on the global markets. Uh, this is something that uh, we are uh, still, uh, we still lack of. Um, so, uh, um, considering the recent global geopolitical uh, development, uh, we can conclude that the Translated Trades uh, Council has to uh, deal with uh, several uh, challenges, and uh, um, uh, the challenges are connected to fast technology development uh, and its implication on societies. Before again, <laughs> I'm referencing the the previous uh, panel uh, where we said that we have problems of. Uh, um, putting the results of uh, uh, our research uh, and development into the practice, into the industry directly. Uh, we are uh, um, uh, getting late uh, uh, into this implementation uh, uh, part. So this uh, is uh, quite a big uh, issue that we have to uh, address. Um, so uh, um, from the perspective of uh, the Central Europe, the challenges are, uh, of course, even bigger than uh, what we were saying just for uh, globally. Um, and, uh, of course, we are here uh, dealing now with uh, this Russian aggression on Ukraine, and, of course, it's uh, here a new geopolitical uh, um, position of uh, China. So um, this, of course, has a serious uh, impact, implication on our uh, energy technology, production, uh, and of course, uh, raw material dependencies. So we have to find um, solutions. And again, in the previous uh, panel, there it was said that we are getting late. Uh, there are already some things that we should have done uh, um, much faster and much uh, uh, before. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, more efforts we should make uh, for uh, extensive collaboration uh, between Europe and the uh, U.S. in industry, uh, in research and development, um, so that we would achieve, uh, as a EU, uh, technological autonomy and, and uh, so sovereignty. Um, yeah, it's, um, I believe that uh, our transatlantic uh, partners could help us uh, reach this uh, sovereignty um, uh, that we are uh, and, and solve the issues that we are dealing uh, with at the moment. Uh, Andre, this, is, this feeds right into your, your area of expertise. I mean, uh, what, is, what Aida is discussing is, you know, Europe is lagging behind. How do we catch up? And you have discussed in many settings, including today, uh, that we can't always be talking about regulation. How do we talk about innovation? Because there's this first mover disadvantage sometimes to regulating. You can regulate yourself out of the game, out of the race. How can Europe best create the conditions for, to lead in critical technology? I'm going to play the role of the provocateur, but I'm used to that. Uh, because simply having the right formula is hard. And I think a lot of political uh, action right now is fed by laziness. It's so easy to spread billions. You have the impression sometimes that the only answer of the Europeans, but by my French and my German friends in particular, you have a problem, let's put billions at it. Well, if it was only a billion problem, then Europe would be world leader. I just give you a number which is scary. Uh, Ida talked about science and technology. Uh, the US uh, Agency for Disruptive Innovation, the 
famous DARPA has put 50 billion euro in current terms since 58, since Sputnik, which was a wake-up call for the US because the continent was at risk for the first time. The European Union, and I love the European Union, has put 200 billion since 1984 in R&D. Are we world leaders in AI? Are we world leaders in semiconductors? Are we world leaders in space? Last year, three launches of Ariane, again, I'm French, 31 launches of SpaceX. So we're not talking about 10% anymore. We're talking about, and between Macron's famous speech in La Sorbonne, where he said, I want to be uh, leading also in technology, 2017, and Scholz's speech uh, three days ago, where he also focuses, you mentioned that, Tyson, on technology, uh, the cloud share of EU uh, providers of cloud have gone from 30 to 15 percent. There's no one who is getting above 1 percent. I'm sure our colleague from Google will tell us how much Google, Amazon, and Microsoft together have as a cloud share. So it's a total political and societal disaster from a technology point of view. But we cannot just stop on the, on the, on the bad things. Number one. Um, what do we need to do is to focus, I mean, there is a currently a counter-offensive in Kherson going on. You don't win a war by being on defense. That's not exist in history. You need to have a regulation, so I don't think we should oppose regulation and, and innovation, but if you don't innovate, if you don't focus on the semiconductors of the future, on the cloud of the future, which will be much more decentralized, thanks to 5G, uh, if you don't focus on AI, which is small data, my four-year-old kid does not need billions of data points to recognize a cat. So the next edge of AI will be small data. This is something where, where the European should focus on. Aida talked about critical raw material. We just decided, rightly so, that in 2035 there will be no more new thermal engines uh, for cars. But we already have 55% of refined lithium uh, that is coming from China and 90% of permanent magnets, which you use to have an efficient electric motor, coming also from China. So if we think Russian dependency is bad, it's only those who have never touched a negotiation with the Chinese who think it's going to be better. It's going to be ugly. And then you talk to a European commissioner, which for the sake of, of uh, elegancy I will not name. I tell, look, let's, let's focus some programs and uh, let's try, like with the vaccines, to do in one year what a European typical research program will take 10 years to do. This commission, commissioner tells me, oh, not, yes, I'm in charge of energy, but that's, in, that's my, my colleague in charge of research, which I should do it. So that is a political failure. And I think we should not accept that. So point number one, focus on that next big thing. Point number two, if we want to be serious on the TTC, we also need to connect the CHIPS uh, strategy, for example. And I've been, Tyson was also involved in that, and several others, I'm sure, in this room, in this civil society dialogue, there is very little coordination. Um, uh, we need to also do our homework when you, need, you see the quality. And, I, and I'm not seeing the US as the big uh, who does it all right. But when you see the, the, the depth of the American uh, study, which is called the National Security Commission on AI, led by your former boss, uh, Eric Schmidt, it's so dense. It's 780 pages. Yes, it's, it's long to the when you look, again, what's coming out of AI, high-level reports uh, of excellent researchers out of the EU, I'm sorry to say it's very shallow. It's very shallow. We need to be much more strategic on that. And it's possible. So it only depends on us. Last point, uh, um, it's, it's, uh, it's the speed. Uh, probably it's a democratic. I mean, I don't want to paraphrase Tony Blair, who, who I thought really good this morning. Um, it's a democratic challenge. Uh, if we take, yes, everybody congratulates each other that DMA and DSA took only two and a half years uh, to, but it's, we are not in a game of being better. We are in a, we are, I mean, faster than before. We are in a game of being better than others. And uh, today, uh, technology cycles are six months. So if, and I'm sure these two younger policymakers will, can change it, and I think the French and the Germans need to be cucked, kicked a little bit in the butt uh, because the slowness of, of policy makers at the European level, because the big countries don't want big changes to happen, let's name a cat, but, uh, cat uh, is going to kill us. We probably need much more pop-up regulation, where we try things, do a sunset clause, assess, do impact assessment if it works, 
and then move on. But that's a total change of the way French and, uh, and Germans and other countries have done policymakers because everybody wants his name, everybody wants his, to be a rapporteur, everybody wants to be involved in the trilogue. I mean, Very this is a little the, the detail, but this needs to change. Otherwise, uh, in five years, we will have 5% cloud and we, will, we keep complaining that our data is not there, but it will be all gone. You mentioned... Uh, it's a message of hope, what I want to say. Eh? It's not gloomy. It's just, it depends on us. It's not the big... Uh, the big danger is not coming from outside. I mean, you, you mentioned the issue of speed, you mentioned the flexibility, the interdisciplinarity yeah. of dealing with tech policy. And if you look at the kind of, the great champions, the tigers of digital innovation, you look at Estonia, Israel, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, and even the United States, what they have, the galvanizing force on their tech policy is a persistent geopolitical threat, some degree of cohesion. Now in the United States, that's not always the case, but it is, and then it gives a sense of national mission. So there's this geopolitical threat that drives a national mission. And when you look at that report that you mentioned, it cuts across immigration policy, education, cybersecurity, innovation, industrial policy. Talents and so on. Talent, Sorry. exactly. All those kind of things. So, Lieva, how does the EU do that? How can the EU define this omnibus term that it uses, digital sovereignty, to create a sense of European mission? I'll go back to the discussion we just had, and I'm really easy to provoke today. <laughs> <laughs> Andre said uh, about regulations and the speed of regulatory uh, aims. Uh, I work with uh, business regulation, or mostly with business deregulation. I hope to work more with business deregulation than regulations. Uh, those who are familiar with business deregulation uh, know uh, that uh, there is such term as regulatory sandboxes, so that is what Andre mentioned before. It's a perfect tool to try new regulatory initiatives. Right now in Lithuania, we are doing it with renewables uh, and uh, really our wind, solar uh, plants and uh, uh, industry has bloomed recently. But what else to say? Uh, there is um, such thing as rules as code. Uh, and uh, I don't know if uh, you are familiar with the term or if these rules as code exist in your countries. Rules as code means that law is written in codified principle, but not as like labor code and stuff, but it's like written in a computer algorithm and uh, all your legal system is built on uh, such basis. Uh, I really know that New Zealanders uh, have, uh, have it, uh, but not many countries in Europe do uh, such things. So that means that Every time that something in the legal system changes, it automatically changes. I don't know if it's in the law, then it's in your uh, some uh, minister orders and stuff like that. So rules as code is an automated legal system. And in Lithuania, we are working with our colleagues and I'm saying like, let's try and do this law as rules as code. And they're like, nah, we cannot do it, it's very hard, you know? So I'm thinking like, no, 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 not all the legal system, not all labor code, just one lot to try and like to look if we are able to, to try this, yeah? And they're like, no, no, we're gonna need like two years. And I'm thinking like, we even, we have a law, we just need to rewrite it in tech terms, in principles of code, of computer code. And we struggle with this, you know, and we imagine ourselves where we can perfectly regulate the most complex systems uh, in the world. And we cannot even, most of our countries in Europe cannot do rules as code, you know. And despite that it would be very beneficial, it would uh, allow uh, business and uh, people to save lots of time scrolling through uh, legal acts. It would uh, require less job of bureaucracy because you don't need to rewrite a uh, law every time that, you don't, I don't know, tax rate changes. It automatically goes into all the systems, yeah, into impact assessments and stuff like that. We cannot do this, but we think that we can regulate uh, industries that are not even there yet. So uh, when talking about, of course, and we can do that, we perfectly demonstrated that in numerous cases, that we are able to regulate something that does not even exist sometimes. It's due to, of course, our market size and um, 
market forces can sometimes be enough to push uh, uh, EU standards into global norms, and it's not always a bad thing. Uh, we had, the, like, mistakes are exceptions, uh, I would say, yeah, uh, but uh, otherwise we are doing pretty good. But uh, as companies, you know, want to sell their products globally, want to sell them worldwide, they might find it cheaper to adhere to one norm, one European norm, one European standard, and uh, they may find it feasible to adapt to US standards, not wasting money on competing uh, standards. Uh, so we can impose our rules, but in the end, it takes two to tango, I think, at least two to tango. And ignoring concerns of our um, partners, not only, for example, US policymakers, but big tech companies as well, is not an option. And it is important that rules that we propose are seen as better alternative for current problems ethically desirable, uh, promoting democracy, freedom of expression, privacy, and other important values, but not as something that's done out of spite, you know, or envy. We cannot scale launch a big tech company, so, uh, and I do believe that in our hearts we are sincere and we aren't doing that in spite, but it may seem for com companies in the world globally that, you know, Europe cannot, so it, uh, it, uh, it creates a, rules that uh, aren't fair for all game players. So uh, I think that it is partnership uh, with our global allies and uh, with big tech companies is, is crucial here. I think that uh, we are successful working with private companies and this war, of course, it shows that somewhere, yeah, not, not, not so much, but really in some places we managed to achieve uh, uh, really great results. For example, fighting disinformation, yeah, it can be done better, but still big tech companies are doing a lot of here in, in this area. Um, I, I, I guess it's new for us, you know, when United States were informing President Zelensky, we all read that it was done like in weeks, months, and etc. Lithuanians, we were called the paranoics of Europe. Yeah, you know, <laughs> ah, Russia, they are again, they are thinking that Russia is going to attack them. But really, it, it provides to be a, 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 a fact in the end. But uh, like, we could not anticipate uh, that if policymakers that uh, act in uh, having uh, information, uh, strategic information, um, were not uh, ready and we were not ready in many areas, so we couldn't, cannot expect that big tech companies uh, like start, start preparing er, themselves earlier. So I think that uh, partnerships is, is very important here. Let me, let me take this rules of code piece before we go to Igor and just ask you one quick question on that. Uh, you know, we see the, the regulation coming out, this new package of platform governance uh, on the Digital Services Act, which you mentioned, uh, talking about content moderation of harmful and illegal speech online, or uh, the Digital Markets Act, which is talking about the, the market power of online platforms and gatekeepers. Um, and I, I think you're right that it, it's coding values. But the question is, is it trying to address the world of 2015, or is it trying to address the world of 2022? I'll answer simply. If you haven't addressed the world of 2015, it's very hard to address the world of 2015. <laughs> good answer, good answer. Um, let's expand this conversation a little bit to the, the transatlantic space, because that's the, the main partnership that we're talking about. Um, as has been mentioned, there is this Trade and Technology Council that was launched at the US-EU summit last year. It has now had two meetings. Um, I think that its agenda was completely inflected by uh, Russia's war on Ukraine. And one of the big deliverables from the last, um, the run-up to the last meeting in Saclay was to compress the time that both sides used to impose sanctions on chips. Um, but now we're moving towards uh, TTC3, as they call it, uh, which will take place in the United States. Some people say in Austin or in Miami, a beautiful, beautiful city. Um, and the pressure is on in Brussels and in Washington for concrete deliverables. Uh, Igor, what could those concrete deliverables be? Well, there's a, an advantage of having great co-panelists. Then before answering your question, you have to refer to some of the points, if, you may, if I may. Thanks for bringing the conversation, the cooperation between governments and tech companies, especially for the war in Ukraine. I think that was so unprecedented to see the level of cooperation and depth that actually ha happened at that 
just to give you a few things, like uh, Google, uh, we worked on four areas in the war response, if we can call it instead of crisis response. One is obviously fighting disinformation. Uh, second was to keep authoritative information available, because obviously you cannot just take down all the information, right? Third is cybersecurity. We've seen a new level of discussions and conversation with governments across the, the bloc, I would say, and, 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 and on the eastern part of, of the European Union. And lastly, obviously, was the humanitarian assistance. Just to give you a sense of uh, the volumes, so the, as, of, uh, as of today, we removed around 9,000 channels on YouTube which were related to Russian propaganda and everything which was related to the war, and more than 70,000 videos. So, you know, the, the, the extent to, you know, to the disinformation that we were all facing, it's incredible, it's still, you know, proceeding and it's just immense. On the other side, you, you know, to be able as a tech company to help, I don't know, four million Ukrainian kids to be online for, you know, for our platform Google for Education or to give, you know, a couple of thousands of teachers the availability and tools to actually deliver the materials is something that makes you a bit humble as well in, in a position how much you can help and support. So leaning into to the, the intro in this conversation, I would say also, you know, the topic of sovereignty, I would rephrase it as, you know, potential. So it's not the question, and it should not be look at black or white. So someone's sovereignty doesn't mean that person or that country cannot cooperate. So if Europe or a European country wants to be sovereign, autonomous, it doesn't mean you're closed, you're, you're, you're inward, you're closed. It just means you know what you want, you have a strategy, you have a vision, and you're not like a boat which is just wandering around in the Adriatic trying to figure out where split is, right? So it's, uh, it's more of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of both, right? So thinking of what you want, as Andre mentioned, what is your strategy? What do you want to achieve? Where, where are you heading? And at the same time, to be able to what I heard a lot is this word cooperation, right? So we don't see there is a mismatch between being autonomous and thinking of your own capacities, potential, let's use the word potential, and at the same time, to be able to, to scale and cooperate uh, globally. On the TTC, uh, Obviously, you know, the, 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 the TTC was established before the war. And I think conversations on how the TTC will be a, would be a platform for mutual cooperation were one kind of conversations then, and I think we can expect different type of conversations going forward. I think what's great is that the, the platform was established, because before that, we didn't have a structured way of, you know, uh, I would say, discussing technological progress, regulation together. The key challenge, going forward will be how to transform the common values that both the US and you have into common standards, common rules. And I think that's the key challenge, how to be as much as concrete as possible and to find, actually to transform what's common into common rules and standards. And there's a lot of things on, on the plate and it's great actually to see that a lot of countries, especially in C, I, I have to say, I'm from the region, and we are seeing uh, a tremendous potential, digital potential in, in C. Um, uh, there is a McKinsey study called the Digital Challengers, where the figure about the digital potential in C is close to 200 billion euros in incremental GDP, if just a small percentage of the digital economy is increased in total. So uh, then the, I just learned today that one of, uh, one of the creation unicorns is valued at five uh, billion uh, dollars. So those companies, and we are reaching, I think, about 50 unicorns all across sea, those companies would never be able to scale without global technology. I will not say US technology, but global technology, exchange, cooperation, and so on. So I think that's one of the key things, is how to really find mutual, mutual uh, uh, values and transform that into common standards and discuss it really, really frankly. Well, let me take up this issue that you brought up and ask uh, Aida this question, because you said, how do we translate our, our common values into common standards? I would even say, I think you might have used the word common rules, which is even better. Yes. Um, um, in light of this pressure that we have from, let's say, uh, adversarial states like Russia and China. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, some of the issues around uh, notice and takedown that Google has been uh, participating in with regard to uh, Russia's war on Ukraine. Um, obviously, the Digital Services Act is coming into online right now. I think there's a lot of interest in Washington uh, about how the different mechanics of the Digital Services Act 
will work, specifically around codes of practice uh, in the context of the European Democracy Action Plan, uh, data availability, et cetera. So my question for Aida is, how can we Atlanticize this model, or is this the model that should be Atlanticized? Um, yeah, I, I think that's <laughs> I'm not used to speaking with mi microphones. Um, definitely, I, I, I think that uh, we should, uh, and again, we are going back to this cooperation, and here I can see also the potential, uh, even though, even though the, this uh, uh, um, Digital Services Act, which is uh, providing some uh, um, uh, regulation, um, uh, I believe this is a good foundation for all of us to, to, to follow, uh, especially, uh, of course, in, in this uh, um, sense that we have to address the, the um, harmful content that is uh, being posted on, on uh, platforms. Uh, in, and um, uh, the one thing is this uh, Ill illegal content that uh, we uh, um, have to address, and uh, in DSA it is uh, um, not giving the definition of the illegal content, but it's giving the um, actually uh, um, uh, the obligations for the platforms what to do and processes uh, uh, about uh, um, the illegal content and what you have already mentioned that you are coping very well with the, uh, with this in the sense of this war in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, there is another aspect that I think is really important and we have to talk is uh, about uh, um, harm uh, um, uh, content that is uh, um, hate speech, misinformation, disinformation. So um, those are, um, uh, let's say, uh, should be implemented through the codes uh, um, uh, uh, of a conduct. Uh, and uh, um, again, uh, I, I just think that this is the only way uh, to, to deal with this is that we all cooperate together. So governments, uh, um, uh, private companies, uh, NGOs, uh, we all have to um, stand in a common ground uh, considering this uh, uh, and the uh, implementation of, of uh, um, um, codes of uh, conduct. And of course, getting then on the other side to the end user who is producing this uh, content and including them also in, in, in this aspect. I, I love the fact that you talked about the end user because the whole time I was thinking the key stakeholder that needs to be involved in this governance process is the user themselves. And yes. you know, if we watch the information ecosystem, particularly in a time of war, we're seeing a lot of evolution. It's not RT and Sputnik necessarily that are propagating misinformation about the war. It's influencers, for example. Yes. So how do you engage them in developing codes of practice from the beginning? And how do you create a co-regulatory environment that involves governments, companies like Google, and particularly these users? I think the, the, the first step is actually raising awareness you know, among, among end users, you know, that they, uh, first they, they need the knowledge. Knowledge is the key aspect of of everything that we are talking here. Uh, so uh, they have to have enough knowledge about the, 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 this issue. They have to, uh, we have to raise awareness among people who are not having uh, that much knowledge. Uh, we have to go through the educational system. We are also, as a, as a government, planning of uh, um, getting into the curricula. Uh, so uh, on all levels of uh, um, educational levels. So uh, to be able to attack this problem um, from the, 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 this uh, uh, end where uh, actually it starts, uh, where, where the content is produced. Uh, and it's really important that uh, the new generations, young, uh, young, our young, our children, uh, are actually included uh, now as much as possible, from the kindergartens, from the primary schools, to understand what is being uh, uh, what, what this means, you know, someone before mentioned TikTok and everything, and the, the, uh, that parents are now frightened what their kid in a two years' time will, will be exposed to. So uh, the only way that we can deal with this, not uh, separating the kids from the technology, this is not the, the way. We have to empower them to be able to, to deal with this technology, to be able to separate the, the, the 
good news or uh, the correct news from the fake news, to be able to separate the misinformation and, and to search for the information from different sources and so on and so on. So this is a quite, a, quite a, a big challenge, but we have to start immediately uh, uh, attacking this, uh, this problem. And it, just you mentioned TikTok. I mean, it's interesting to think about, you know, a social media environment that's so dynamic, where the flows and market share are changing so much uh, that in this moment in Europe, uh, the two uh, social media platforms with the highest growth numbers are, are a Chinese and a, and a Russian uh, social media platform, mm -hmm. of course, uh, Telegram. Uh, I have a question for for you, Yulva. I mean, this is something that has come up. Uh, a little bit is is the question around cybersecurity. Uh, you know, we're in a moment right now where every second there are 137 new IoT devices coming online. So just in the course of this conversation, we'll have almost a half a million new devices coming online. Um, at the same time, you know, in Ukraine, it, in some ways it was the dog that didn't bark. That had to do with capacity, perhaps, but we're seeing new attacks in places like Costa Rica, right now in uh, Montenegro, for example, attacks on government servers, um, and a, a risk environment that is so high that everybody from Lloyd's of London to the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund are saying that this is the risk that nobody's paying attention to. How is Lithuania tackling this? How can the EU tackle this? And how should this be dealt with in your... No, cybersecurity okay. in general. Okay, because <laughs> not so many things that are on internet right now in Lithuania. Uh, yeah, just a joke. I, I hope, by the way, I'm not on this panel. Somebody's not cracking the government page, but hope not. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Lithuania is uh, one of the leaders in the world in uh, cybersecurity, was sixth in the indexes. So, uh, we are doing it pretty well, but because of proximity, of course, our uh, not so uh, welcoming neighbors. Uh, so um, we uh, have uh, cyber security, we have legal basis as well. Uh, we talked during the lunch that Lithuania is, uh, uh, has made amendments to some uh, legal acts uh, regarding the use of uh, third party or third country technology in critical infrastructure, first of all, 5G. So in Lithuania, there are laws that uh, we only are buying uh, 5G uh, technology and infrastructure from reliable sources, from those sources that do not cause harm to our national security. Uh, companies, uh, members of EU and NATO, not, uh, not all third countries. And uh, all the technology that has been used previously uh, must be uh, removed from uh, critical infrastructure until the end of 2025. So these are like steps that government is taking. A lot of is done by uh, the public it, uh, it itself. Uh, when you mentioned, uh, for example, uh, influencers and TikToks, in Lithuania, an influencer who would be eating publicly chips or a ch chocolate bar of a company who is not Russian, but who is selling its products in Russia, for example, it would, he, would, he or she would be canceled like next day. <laughs> really, it's, I, I know that it sounds for some of you, you know, harsh, but it's the reality. When you live near the border of Russia, you very much look what you put in your bag in the shop. So uh, public is really aware of the situation we are living in. And people we have in Lithuania, I, I told during the lunch we have in Lithuania, uh, several hundred, uh, s several thousand army of elves uh, who are fighting against Russian trolls in the internet and they are reporting web pages, uh, Facebook accounts, uh, advertisements and stuff in the internet. We also have the bank initiative that is uh, made and actually it's financed through, like partially financed through uh, big tech companies uh, for debunking myths and uh, propaganda publicly in the media. And one third of Lithuanians are participating in sending that information to the debunk initiative. So uh, lots, of, uh, lots of this can be done by us ourselves. So, so Lithuania is taking a whole of nation strategy just bottom up by virtue of the citizens and the percept threat perception. Yeah, it's cooperation. Just cooperation. <laughs> Let's go back to the cooperation. Excellent. But yeah, but it, a lot of... Uh, 
initiatives are actually, yeah, bottom up. We managed to buy Bayraktar for Ukraine by cashing in, you know, like all this nation cashed in some euros, two euros, three, 50 euros, and bought a Bayraktar for Ukraine. We were the first to do this. Uh, so it's like uh, the war is on the front, and we are, everyone's doing the best he or she can. And we are, we ca we are like, you know, doing it in the cyber uh, area, in the digital area right now. Andre, you want to jump in on this too? Yeah, just uh, two uh, funny, if I can say funny stories. We just had in France a new, uh, uh, a new uh, National Assembly elected in June. And you know what was the nice little welcome package that every 577 new MP received? It was a little Huawei box with a connection tool so that they can be connected all the time. Uh, that is June 2022. And I also remind that, that the European Commission, I think, attributed um, uh, uh, um, a package to uh, British Telecom, which to my best knowledge is not anymore part of the EU for secure communication systems. So uh, to build on what you said about sovereignty, sovereignty is exactly what you said. It's not about being isolated, but it's being strong. And my worry is today that the responsibility of the EU is, is, is massive. There is an alliance of democracy that needs to happen, and obviously with the US first and foremost. But if we are not strong, number one, we will not be a little bit tempering the very hawkish atmosphere against China that exists in DC. Uh, I mean, just look at what happened in the last weeks. Otherwise, these two countries will fall in the famous uh, Tusilditi uh, trap. I think the EU has a huge role uh, not to mitigate the tensions, but, uh, but to make sure that, that that does not end into a third world war. Uh, and secondly, uh, if there is not a coordinated approach to supply chains, think about semiconductors or AI, you know, we will have great talks, but TTC 1 and 2, frankly speaking, was a lot of hot water. So if we don't deliver, the risk is that every country will, will go. Just one last point on cybersecurity I mentioned before. Uh, and I see uh, some European policymakers or former policymakers in the room. Uh, it's not just, I mean, the digital single market does not exist. So let's also kill this, uh, this myth. Uh, there are 27 national uh, uh, cyber watchdogs. There is BSI, ANSI, all great people, but even the French and the German barely talk together. And then you have an additional la layer who tries hardly to do something, which is called ENISA but which at the end of the day does mostly, you know, very important training, which you need to do, uh, which ha the, the direct conclusion is one person at ENISA, I cannot tell you who it is, told me that if we had something like colonial pipeline kind of issue, they would not be able to inform all the suppliers downstream. So we would not be able to react. And I think that it's legitimate that every country has a cyber watchdog, but the fact that the politicians are not really cutting into the administration and removing these barriers will make, one, very difficult to react. And secondly, forget about building champions. Because the, national, the, 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 the continental market for these unicorns that you mentioned about will be increasingly the US. If you don't, I mean, in tech, the downside is the same for everybody. You can lose everything. But if the upside is just to do a great Slovenian, a great French, or a great German company, the upside is not as incredible as when you have a Chinese giant or a US giant. So valuations will always be different. And that's why when a Chinese or US investor will come, he will just uh, value the, com the European company much more because he knows he will give them a bigger potential. So it's not about pouring an additional taxpayer. It's really getting the single digital market. Does it exist in energy? Forget it. Does it exist? So I think this is a huge failure of the European project, is the single digital market, the single tech market does not exist. What are we waiting for? What is Mr. Breton waiting for? What is Madame van der Leyen for? What are the national watchdogs waiting to a bit give back of their apparent power, but which is a, it's a puppet power, because you don't, if you have a German uh, watchdog, you. I mean, if you just look at your borders, it's like, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if, if, uh, if a military commander was just looking at one region, you know, the front is happening everywhere in the cyberspace. So I'm a bit frustrated about the fact that it all depends on us. It depends on 
foresight, it depends on execution. Uh, I mean, the time of speeches, be it in Vienna, be it in La Sorbonne, is over. What are we waiting to act? Well, let me push you on this because you put a lot of very provocative things on the table, but you are our uh, token Franco-German on the panel, so you're very familiar with Nobody, the... Nobody's perfect. <laughs> you're familiar with the discussions in both capitals, and, uh, you know, the issue of digital sovereignty is a real tension there. Sometimes it's very player-specific, and, you know, you're talking about developing champions, and sometimes it's rule-specific. Um, and you mentioned Denisa and cybersecurity. One of the big debates that's ramping up right now is around um, European cyber cer certification for cloud computing, specifically uh, cloud service providers that provide services to public administrations and militaries. So we all know that there's a lot of market share held by non-European companies in this space, specifically American companies in Europe. But, you, but the United States isn't the same thing as China. So how should Europe approach this discussion around non-European players providing very sensitive services to European governments that are allies? Well, first, the, 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 the typical answer that you hear, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm using the easy chord in, in Ljubljana about talking about bashing Paris and Berlin, it's so easy. Um, it's, oh, the private players should use more European solutions. I think actually we, we forget one big tool of policymakers, which is public procurement. I think uh, public procurement is an incredible tool to make new solutions emerge uh, with new, uh, and I love your point about rule as code. I think it's very interesting because it reminds me what in the military you call the mission. That means you, you determine what is the goal, but then you let the players, so you give a framework, but you let the players uh, act. We, of, we often do a bit the opposite. We are not clear about the end game, so it's difficult for us to explain to our citizens. By the way, democratic deficit, so people don't really know where we're heading to, but then you try to over-regulate. And in today's world where nobody knows what's ha going to happen in a week, good luck to try to anticipate that. For those who are sailing, we're close to the lake, uh, uh, you need to know where the port is, where you want to go. But if you want to determine each a bar, I don't know how you say, each turn you do, you will, never, you will never win. So this is probably the mindset in which we are. So I think public procurement is a tool to make local solutions emerge. Uh, I think we need to, obviously we need to distinguish Alibaba Cloud and Google Cloud is not the same. But I would love that, uh, that uh, more national players emerge, but they will not emerge if you are a French player and you need to go to BSI to be certified. It, there needs to be like a doctor or like, uh, like, a, like a, a bank, uh, a capacity to be immediately approved. But we can see still there are national, you know, and you know, often I hear in Paris a European voice, but at the end of the day, we have a very, f I mean, we talk about French tech. Uh, what, what is this concept of French tech? Makes zero sense. I mean, we compete, I mean, the Minister of, of Digital, the former one, luckily he's gone, um, uh, you know, he used to say, yes, we have more unicorns than Berlin uh, or London, but that's not the competition. The competition is big Beijing, a little bit Palo Alto. So, so I think the, f the framework, again, it depends on us. So the positive news is that public procurement could let these, these national champions emerge, provided we don't try to do Amazon Web Service. See, I don't use Google <laughs> Cloud. Huh? Uh, we don't want to create Amazon Web Service. It makes zero sense. I mean, they invest these hyperscalers a billion a quarter. But what is the next generation of cloud? Decentralized cloud, portable cloud that maybe you bring with you. Uh, a button, I expect from, from the EU regulator to have a button next to I accept the cookies that you probably all clicked 20 times since this morning. Uh, can I extract my data and carry them with me? It's hard to do technically, but that's for Google to find a solution. Uh, but then you solve most of the data issue, which is uh, potentially one of the, the, the enablers. I mean, the GDPR allowed one thing, an indirect thing. I don't think it helped reduce the, 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 the it actually created barrier of entry. Uh, it's all about impact assessment for the, for the big hyperscalers. But it created the awareness in all organizations that, that actually they have more data than they thought. So that is a great thing. So now what do we do with it? Uh, can we build champions around mobility? I mean, the day where we will have Google, Waze, 
all that connected, uh, and, and you probably know that Waze now implements something which allows you to, to, to know what is the most energy efficient road. So they're very, very smart to play on what will be the next differentiator is efficient uh, traveling. Will that be as possible with uh, the DMA? I think the DMA, uh, first, it's, it's all about anticipation of what could happen. Let's be humble. Have we been able to, ex to anticipate what would be the, the result of WhatsApp and Facebook merger in 2015? I would love to have a, a, a regulator that can anticipate what will happen in 10 years' time. I think we have to be humble, it's, it's not possible. Um, but it's a good ground. Um, the question is, will it allow the players to become actually smarter? Uh, or will it allow also our own ecosystem to emerge? Because again, if, if we want to be partners, but we have zero uh, boxer to put on the ring, uh, you know, uh, we are going to be, uh, we are going, it's, it's going to be an all-American uh, uh, and, and it will increase populism because it's very easy for populists to say, look, all your data are in the hands of, uh, of uh, U.S. companies. And I think that will play, uh, at the end of the day, against democracies. Igor, I have to go to you on this because Google Cloud was mentioned a couple of times, but maybe we can uh, expand out a little bit. I mean, to what extent does data governance need or should play a role in the Trade and Technology Council? And maybe to tag on to that, one issue that has been cordoned off from the TTC has been the issue of a post-privacy shield agreement, uh, a new, what was announced in, in March, uh, uh, transatlantic data pr privacy framework. Um, how important is that? Is that coming? And how can these two sides deal with the next generation of data governance questions so that we don't have a repeat of what we've seen in the past? So just to go a bit back on regulation, I think, you know, we've seen, and uh, someone mentioned, I think Andre, that, uh, or uh, the colleague from uh, Lithuania, uh, the regulations already exist. It's not a question whether we have enough regulation. The question is the quality, the, I would say, the pragmatism of this regulation and how smart, if I can use that word, the regulation is. So in terms of the DSA, DMA, which, which were mentioned, we as a company, we welcome both of the proposals. And on the D DSA part, obviously, if you want to, you know, uh, improve content moderation, quality of the content, what, and, and so on, that's a valid argument. On DMA side, that's, there has been also a lot of challenges on the security front, where, again, you are, we were facing solutions where there should be, according to some provisions, forced data sharing with some third parties outside the EU and outside the US, which is, guess, guess who? Right, so uh, this kind of things are always coming, you know, all, uh, on the back, in, happening in the backstage or in the in the footnotes or whatever, if, of people who are actually reading these proposals and seeing what's coming, as Ander mentioned, a bit further, right? So that that's that's on on, on that space. In terms of the data, as you mentioned, I think uh, what's coming next it's extremely critical. Uh, at this point, uh, businesses on both sides of the, of the Atlantic are pretty much insecure and they feel the political instability about the new framework of data sharing, you know, based on, 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 on uh, what's the next privacy shield, let's call it this, this way. And obviously, as also Aida mentioned, you know, it's not straightforward. It's not like Google or one single player can solve the issue or it, of this information, of content, of AI, whatever. It's just something that has to be discussed on, on, in real details and, 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 and you know, s small, small instances, right? So uh, on, on, on that side, I, I think what's, uh, what's great to see is the executive order, which is we're expecting it in, to see it in the US, which is kind of like going in the direction that data actors can actually you know, be, have, do actionable items on the data. Right? But at the same time, I think there will be a lot of challenges on the, on the industrial data sharing and, and discussions about, you know, what is protectionist behavior, what is not, what kind of data, why a company can share some data with the other, not, why not with the other one. And I think key is due process, safeguards, as in the DMA, which, you know, safeguards and also what we've seen. Uh, and we also, in a way, ask the European Commission in our so participation in the proposals, if you introduce, please introduce safeguards, but at the same time, we need some regulatory dialogue. You know, who do we talk to about aligning on these kind of things? Who are the bodies? Who are, is, is it the local level, national level, Brussels level? So I think these kind of things will probably determine the next 
era of data sharing, which I think is pretty critical. I mean, we've seen it, it's on top of the agenda on, of the commission and, and, and the administration since recently, I think it was February when uh, both Osama von der Leyen and President Biden expressed the commitment to actually go forward. I think this next generation data governance question is really going to be a proof yeah. of concept for the TTC. Yeah. Because um, uh, one of the, the areas that was cordoned off when the, at the genesis of the TTC was this idea, we don't want to deal with our past grievances, but this is something that's coming, so we have to anticipate it. We have a lot of brilliant people in this room right now, a lot of uh, policymakers, a lot of, a lot of people with IT expertise. So we want to open it up to you guys to ask questions and comments. So maybe I can get a round of two to three questions uh, from the audience, if there are any questions. We have a lot of stuff on the table. Regulation, Ukraine, uh, China, trustworthy vendors, 5G, et cetera. And if there aren't any questions, I have a lot of questions. So, any takers? Please. Do we have a microphone? I can speak up. Okay. Okay, so let's keep it like that. Um, if the internet is divided in different protocols and standards, uh, if, so for example, the Western democracy has their own internet protocols, the Russians have their own, and um, China goes and of course, very different direction, sharing some with Russia or not. This seems to be already the case. Um, how, was, how will this process also in terms of data disinformation proceed? Um, are there any further interactions? And um, is this something which could you actually address by regulation or is it just um, you cannot regulate which you always revise in new technical standards the next day so regulation makes no sense? So, uh, so, so it's kind of a splinter net question, but also yes. um, information uh, ecosystems and how they can be Thank sealed you very off. Much. Yeah. Maybe that's, uh, that's a great question for Aida and maybe uh, Yeva. Yes. Again, sorry, <laughs> each time. I'm not sure that uh, we can regulate uh, uh, this. Uh, again, I, I have to uh, admit that I've just entered into this uh, uh <laughs> zone of uh, policy making. And uh, so um, I, just before when I was uh, hearing Andre mention all this stuff, I just got a bit like, uh, uh, yeah, I, I thought, oh, come on, we have to do this stuff, you know. And I'm as, as I'm coming from the research R&D, uh, this as um, uh, so, uh, so I, I can see that we, we lack of this implementation and, and we have problems. We are relating on relying too much on a, a top-down approach, uh, um, regulating stuff, uh, uh, policy making, uh, but we have to go in opposite direction. I think we have to use also this uh, bottom-up approach, you know, and, and implement as soon as possible the, the, the solutions. Um, I, I just remember that uh, um, I've read that uh, uh, Slovenia is uh, number one in the world uh, um, uh, by number of uh, researchers uh, uh, working on artificial intelligence per capita. Because Slovenia is so small, you know, but there are such a huge number of, uh, of uh, people dedicated and working on this. We have a huge potential, a huge, uh, uh, enormous knowledge there. Uh, but, but we lack of the, of the implementation. Okay. Like uh, the implementation, you know, and 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 using these uh, uh, actually uh, uh, this knowledge in the real uh, real life solutions. So it was um, before it was mentioned the the uh, public administration. There is a one good example that I was like really happy to hear, you know, that we have uh, uh, the 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 system that is uh, um, the the platform called uh, Tray and uh, that is using actually this is a real world implementation of uh, artificial intelligence using it uh, as a is a background background to optimize the the workload uh, and the uh, load of data from different sources, you know. So. I want to see more of this, you know, the, the, the real implementations, uh, whether it's uh, from a private sector, whether it's in a, in a public sector, but yeah, in, in, in general, now if I, I, I talk as a, as a, now as a policy maker, we have to find a way to, 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 to easy this process and make it straightforward. Maybe I'm not, again, too enthusiastic. Probably someone will say, uh, yeah, just do it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have to keep up uh, uh, this spirit. We want that enthusiasm. 
Leva, please. We just heard the sounds of circular economy yeah. <laughs> in the building. So, um, yeah, uh, like I, I'm, I'm also not here very comfortable to give a direct answer to your question. I think that internet is a product of democracy. First of all, it's, it, it was created in democracies. It, it flourished in democracies. How can we uh, ban Chinese from using their internet? They managed to copy everything. <laughs> they will manage to copy any internet they want, you know. And so how can we regulate? We, we sometimes cannot agree on some topics with them. So how can we uh, regulate internet if they are going to have separate one? I don't know. I, I, I just hope to be optimistic and hope that sometime Russia as a whole will come back to its senses and maybe democratic processes will flourish in the world and we, don't, and we won't need to talk about it. Of course, right now, it's sad. We, everyone who enters social networks, we can see how uh, Russia especially is working right now with disinformation. We see that how the spread of like, you know, support for Putin's war in Africa, for example. Like, and people right there who would like to stay on this, our internet, and they are sane, you know, and they understand what the war in Ukraine is. I can imagine when they log on to some platform and they see the content created by trolls, mostly by trolls, they can feel so alone and so, you know, eh, detached from their communities and they can think that, oh my God, my, maybe I'm wrong, maybe this war is justified and stuff like that. So I think that what can we do right now is work and I'm here uh, looking at Igor as well. We all must work towards that we don't need different internets for different continents and stuff like that. We must try somehow to, to work with tools we can, tools we can develop to avoid situation of splinter that. Well, uh, yes. Uh, well, one little uh, twist to your question. It already exists. Uh, on Facebook, on Meta, you already have the echo chambers. You, this company, sorry to point to that, managed to create within our societies different silos. And this is much more worrying than what the Chinese do on their side or the Russians do on their side. They created that within our own country, uh, with, within our own societies. And if we don't solve that, yes, it will be a bit of regulation. But again, the, the, the big thing is how can we create the social platforms of the future that will not rely on the classical engagement? That is a wonderful theme for the Slovenian AI researchers. But I don't see this prioritization made at the EU level or at the member state level. This is a project where also you can get all society behind it. Now, currently, we're just lamenting on, on Facebook and then welcome them as state uh, head of when Mark Zuckerberg visits uh, Berlin uh, or Berlin. We are very schizophrenic on that. Igor, please. Just wanted to you know, touch upon a really amazing point on the digital divide. So, you know, it raises also two topics. One is this digital fragment, fragmentation, which just for statistics, in the past two years, the G20 countries introduced 1,700 new laws on digital economy, which are not r coordinated. So 1,700 new laws in the past two years at the G20 level. So, so much about coordination within even close-minded countries or economically connected countries. A second is this digital authoritarianism, right, where countries which did not invent the internet, such as China or Russia, are using it for two purposes. One is to limit the freedom of their own people, and the second is to disinform them. Solutions to be discussed. Well, you know, everybody up here has talked about the, the problem of coordination among states, perhaps like-minded states, or the clash between digital democracies and perhaps digital authoritarianism. But we have a practice that just came out, this exercise with the Declaration on the Future of the Internet. And I think that there are a lot of strengths there, and there could be some challenges there. Uh, you mentioned uh, that a there's a narrative in Africa, a disinformation narrative around uh, Russia's war on Ukraine developing. I think it's probably present in India, in Latin America, etc. And those are the same countries that didn't sign up to the Declaration on the Future of the Internet. So is the term like-minded states 
becoming shorthand for the global north? And how do we make sure that the idea of inclusion in internet governance spreads across other democracies in the global south? Yeah, I, I, I just recently saw a post of Ian Bremer uh, uh, on Facebook from a Eurasia group, how the whole propaganda narrative is interconnected, you know, from Ma Mason Lodge to uh, COVID vaccines to, uh, I don't know, e every other uh, theory that you can imagine, they are all interconnected a lot. And, and of course, we do see that um, some people are more skeptical to it than others. And of course, uh, we do see that uh, right now when more information is available, to us due to our democratic governance, governments, we are less likely to fall into the rabbit hole. But of course, of those countries uh, tend to fall into those rabbit loopholes, not only because of information available to them. Uh, information was available to Arabic Spring, yeah, and that's why it happened, the movement happened. So these tools can be used for good purposes, but I mean, uh, there are people, uh, and those countries tend to have large number of inhabitants, large number of people. These people most probably are still like living in developing countries, and they aren't uh, ac accessing education levels that we are uh, accessing. And I think that that is one part of the problem, that when you cannot, you know, s simpler things are not available to you than such dis discussions as ours where, where we discuss that, oh yeah, that's disinformation and smart tools to fight it. These people uh, like lack basic education sometimes, lack critical thinking uh, uh, subjects at schools and so on and so on. So I think that that is one point of action where, where we can like, hope to improve in the future. Yeah. Andre, I saw you nodding when we were talking about the Declaration of the Future of the Internet and the lack of participation of even elites in the global south, uh, including governments. Um, one aspect is media literacy uh, and social media literacy. What else do you see as necessary to kind of bring uh, the Global South into internet governance? Uh, like Tony Blair said, I have another appointment, so I need to... <laughs> That's a hard question. Um, I want to come back to this topic of education. I think, uh, you know, Finland has been a lot on the spot uh, for some dancing lessons that we should all uh, look at. But uh, I think um, Finland, with a lot of Nordic countries, and, and I think also Baltic uh, countries, have been very good on this basic education uh, of the 21st century. Uh, indeed, I mean, you know, Wikipedia is today much 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times better than, than the best teachers for content. Content today is something that evolves very quickly. And by the way, again, the DARPA model, why people at DARPA change every four years, because they look at the same problems with totally new eyes, which we need to do. A small message to public administration that needs probably to also have a little bit more revolving doors, people coming from academia to public policy and going back. But I close the, the loop. So I think this, this, this focus, and it's a wonderful European project, on, on, on the education of the future, on the honnête homme, like the French say, and, and honnête femme, obviously, you need to add. Um, uh, what, what makes a citizen of the 21st century? What makes critical thinking? And we all know that happens very young. It's very difficult to retrain these skills. I love this topic about hard skills and, and, uh, the, and uh, hard human skills and hard tech skills that were mentioned uh, this morning. Um, and you know, when I hear that Europe lacks a project or a vision, that is a vision that can also embark everybody as a a uh, parent or a father or cousin or mother or whatever. So I think this is, this is something which will help. The problem is it's a 20-year, 30-year project. So how do you wire that in uh, the political project? Um, probably it's getting education out of the mastery treaty, and it's a German who's speaking, it's not the French here. Uh, um, probably it's about revisiting. Uh, uh, some of the edu uh, sharing the best experience. I, I think we don't know enough what's going in your countries and um, 
uh, and and I think the int it's it's about building the the digital world of tomorrow. Uh, my little frustration is that COVID was a terrible human experience, but it's also an amazing. Now that everybody is coming back to some kind of normality, uh, it's a wonderful way to to probably change the way uh, we 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 educate our our young kids and uh, and how do we. we how do we embed these visions uh, in the in the technology we are we are building? That's why I'm so passionate about technology because y you can either be guided by technology and, and then you have this feeling like the Brits say we lost control, mm -hmm. or you kind of shape the future you want. And I think it's or uh, the, the the game is out. So and I think this is something where we can embark, for example, Africa with us or the global south with us. Uh, but it needs to go beyond uh, you know big meetings that are not followed by, by, by real action. I mean, I grew up in Africa, and I'm very, very, very worried about how indeed uh, the Russians are using social media uh, to, 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 to completely twist uh, pretty easily. And uh, we, are not, uh, we are not reacting, or we are reacting with kind of old-fashioned, oh, you need more aid. No, that's, it's, it's about a question of human dignity. It's, it's obviously money, uh, but money is not lacking. I've heard that today. The, you know, there's no more limit. So, uh, uh, but it's a, it's about a, a, a real project and an education project. That would be an incredible EU African uh, uh, project. But I've not heard uh, enough about that. So you you bring up the perfect concluding question. So I'm just going to go down the line, and everybody gets to answer with one sentence um, because we're running out of time. You know, we talked about you know strategic partnership as the catalyst for digital transformation, with the Trade and Technology Council as kind of the focal point. So, what could be that great transatlantic digital project? If we come back here in a year, what should we be talking about as that project that is focusing the minds in capitals? So, we'll start with Igor and just go down the line if that's possible. <laughs> Give me some time to think about it. <laughs> is any takers to start? <laughs> Educating Africa. Yeah, and, I, and I would add, actually, not something harder tech like semiconductors or AI. I would add, how do we, how do democratic societies, kind of reinvent long-term thinking? I'm worried that today the only ones who are thinking, who supposedly, because I don't think it's that true, think 50 years ahead, are authoritarian states. How do we reinvent the capacity? in our countries to, to have a, a real dream. It should not be only China that has a dream, which I'm not sure I understand today, but it should be the democratic societies. And by projecting, by having several, it's about experimenting. Nobody knows. Uh, so that would be a, how do we put the best brains and a very bottom-up approach? We should have a convention for the future of democracies, but not this summer, sorry. This, very technocratic exercise we saw in the last two years. And I heard, uh, I think it was uh, Charles Grant who said, I don't see the, the outcome now, uh, the, the follow-up, the execution. Uh, but that would be something interesting on the, on the, on the two sides. And might counter populism popping up in the US. OK, the operating system of democracy. So it's a big one. Uh, that we are, uh, like, w what we were talking today a lot about digital standards. We didn't touch, didn't have time to touch upon, you know, semiconductors or renewables or stuff like that. But uh, that is a big stuff to touch upon as well. Education about standards, why they are important, and how people, business, and societies can uh, participate in their creation. Yeah. Participation, multi-stakeholder standard creating, which yes. is essentially also operating yeah. systems, right? Yeah. <laughs> Please. Yeah, I'm. I'm still thinking about <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the the project, but I, I think that here is a key issue: our data. We have to do something uh, co on a common ground uh, on on those all those issues uh, on on a, a data. Uh, Definitely interoperability. Uh, we have heard a lot um, also today uh, on on those issues. Um, so we we have to uh, we have to 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 find our way uh, in in this area. All right. So interoperability and data. 
Well, next year, if I'm here at PLED, I will be happy to meet the representatives from the TTC, which would mean that the TTC from a platform became an operational, functional body, which actually sets common standards for the technology progress of both sides, US and EU. Okay, so the, the, <laughs> the TTC becomes operational, is set, and is taking place in BLED. So thank you. On that, on that note, I think we're going to wrap the panel. Thank you so much to the panelists, and thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.